This right here is one of my most favorite old school DirectX 10 GPUs of all time. Not only due to its excellent performance on which we will talk about in a minute, but also its compact single slot design, great temperatures, as well as single 6-pin required to power this 15-year-old beast. Released all the way back in late 2007, it was the least powerful in the series, falling behind the 3870 and of course the 3870 X2. The main differences between the 3850 and 3870 is the fact that the 3870 was using GDDR4 memory, a type which faded away fairly quickly, as it didn't really improve performance of the cards that much and was fairly costly. Other differences include clock speeds as well as bandwidth, with the number of shading units staying the same across both of the cards. So in many regards, the 3850 was a cut-down version of the 3870, therefore consuming 30 watts less than its bigger brother. So with the existence of the 3850 now justified as a cheaper, more cut-down version of the 3870 with solar memory, let's see what this model can offer performance-wise in retro games, but also in newer games from the 2010s that use the DirectX 10 API. Keep in mind that the 3850 I have is a 256MB model with a GDDR3 memory. There do exist other models with 512MB and 1GB, with the 1GB version using DDR2 memory, so I don't really believe the extra VRAM helps out on that. But I guess that was just a marketing trick on selling the 3850 to people with less tech knowledge. I'm sure the 256MB version would beat the 1GB card despite having a quarter of the memory. But now with the technical terms out of the way, let's see what the card can offer. Back in 2005, 1080p was far away from a very popular resolution for gaming. Therefore, I was a bit skeptical about using 1080p in this game. But as it turns out, 1080p doesn't represent the slightest problem for this GPU even with the settings turned up to the maximum values. Back in 2007, you were really in for a treat using the 3850 for older games. And remember, most people used 4x3 monitors back then, meaning that the results could have been even better at lower resolutions. Overall, just a great experience whichever resolution you choose. The well-known system killer Fear also ran fantastically with the 3850. I chose 720p in the maximum settings here. Using higher resolutions with the same settings does lead to frame rates close to the edge of playable, and I believe 720p is just perfect here. The game looks great and runs flawlessly, with great averages and nothing to complain about. It might be worth noting, as I'm using a hyper-threaded 3rd gen i3, you can spot that the game only uses two cores of the CPU, basically leaving the other two cores untouched. That shows how older games were meant to run on dual-core CPUs. No one really optimized games for more than that back in the day. Skipping a few years into the future, and we can see the 3850 starting to struggle with maintaining the same levels of visual quality as it did with older games, with Far Cry 3 running at 720p and all the settings turned all the way down. This is decent performance for a 5-year-old GPU, and Far Cry 3 wasn't really the best optimized game back in the day, especially not for hardware that old like the 3850. Moving on to a better optimized title like Tomb Raider, the 3850 can even handle 1080p, albeit with heavily reduced visual quality, offering FPS around 30 most of the time. The results are honestly quite impressive for a GPU that has only 256MB of VRAM, and being 6 years old at the time of Tomb Raider's release, 2013 also marked the official end of driver support for the 3000 series. Therefore, games after that might not have run at all, and with the limiting factor called DirectX 10, it wouldn't be much longer anyways until the 3850 would fail to launch them. So what's there left to test after 2013? Well, Metro OS Light Redux does run ok on this GPU, with the main problem being not so consistent FPS, changing between just about 30 to over 60 FPS depending on the complexity of the scene. In my opinion, it can't be described as a really good experience, as the frame rate can drop from 60 to 25 in a matter of seconds. Most probably one of the best games that supports the DirectX 10 API is AC Black Flag. The only problem is that it doesn't really like older GPUs that much, requiring a heavy reduction in resolution as well as visual quality, in order to even get closer to 30 FPS. Overall, it's not a terrible experience. I could play like this without a problem. Seven years after the release, the 3850 is on its knees, struggling with pretty much every game there is. In general, 
2015 marked possibly the end of usage of the DirectX 10 API, with a few games here and there still using it, but it started to fade away a few years prior to that. Therefore, the 3850 was reaching the end of its capabilities, in terms of running new games. There were just a few more games that could run on it after 8 years of its existence, most notably GTA 5 and Outlast 2. The only thing that saved it from certain death were esports games. And that is while hoping that the games actually supported RTX 9 or 10. Generally speaking, the 3850 was a really nice GPU for the time it was around, and considering that I paid just about $5 for it recently, I would not complain. After all, this can be a base for a really capable retro gaming computer, with really great performance. Once a flagship, now considered useless by many. That's just how it goes with time and tech. I hope you enjoyed this look back at the very capable DirectX 10 Beast. Stick around for some more beastly GPUs from the past. I hope we have a great time in the coming year.